morning we take a look at Matthew 28, verses 16 through 20. If you have your Bibles with you, please turn there to Matthew 28. Using a few Bible, you can find this on page 835. Before we hear God's word read and preached, let's go to our Lord and ask you to illumine our hearts and minds, that we might rightfully receive that which he has for us. Please join me in prayer. Lord God, we do come before you this morning. We thank you and praise you, Lord, that you reveal yourself in a mighty way through your word. So Lord, as we hear your word read and preached, we ask you might do a mighty work in our hearts. Lord, help us not just to be hearers, but to be doers of your word. <coughs> help us, Lord, to see this clear command to go forth and make disciples. Help us, Lord, to be empowered to do so by keeping an eternal perspective. So Lord, help us not to be downcast over the end of the Christmas season, over the end of the year, but rather, Lord, help us have a hopeful expectation as we look forward to what lies ahead. Your promise is being fulfilled. We ask these things in Jesus Christ's most precious name. Amen. So Matthew chapter 28, beginning at verse 16. Hear now God's holy, inerrant, and infallible word. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So Christmas has come and gone once again. Are you sad? Are you downcast? Do you find yourself already looking at the calendar and thinking how only 360 more days till Christmas is here again? It's so common, much like postpartum depression, to get post-Christmas blues. And this is because Christmas brings hopes and expectations that are often left unrealized. But you know, there's one person I know who never has post-Christmas blues. Somebody who always has something else to look forward to, something else on the horizon. And that's my daughter, Trinity, because her birthday is five days after Christmas. So on December 26th, when you're pouting and in gloom thinking it's over, she's going, I still got my birthday. What wasn't under the Christmas tree, I may still see wrapped up in a present. She gets the thought of thinking about going down to South Jersey going to Penn Pizza, where she gets her own personal Panzerati. She's got something yet to look forward to. And guess what? So do you. It may not be your birthday, but eternity awaits you. See, this is the key to how you go about looking at Christmas. By beating your post-Christmas blues, by looking at not what's past, but what's to come. Once you to follow along, as we head to the point of the message. Three things we're going to see. First, are you waiting or down? Second, there's work to do. And third, there's more to come. And this brings us to the point of the message. Here's what I want you to get down. Beat your post-Christmas blues by thinking eternal. So first, are you waiting or down? Often at Christmas time, we have these high hopes, high expectations, because after all, as Kate McAllister reminds us, Christmas is the season of perpetual hope. So what this means is when Christmas rolls around, people have high hopes for things getting better, broken relationships being restored, people who have been distant and apart suddenly coming back together. But what do you find happens so often? None of those things. And what happens is we can get down. We can be downcast. And this can leave us doing one of two things, either waiting for next year to roll around again, or to begin doubting that it'll ever happen. You ever been there? You ever face a situation, maybe some sin you struggle with, maybe some financial woe or health concern, and you start doubting that things are ever gonna get better, that things are ever gonna change? See, when you start looking at what you don't have, it's easy to doubt. Imagine, you're battling some sin, and you're battling it time and time again. Don't you reach that point where you start doubting you're ever going to conquer it? 
Think about being one of the 11 apostles here. You were looking, the Messiah had come. Finally, he was going to make things right, turn things around, give you your freedom. But what did you discover? His Christmas birth became his crucifixion death 33 years later. And all seemed lost. All seemed hopeless. You had doubts filling. But then something happened. You heard something amazing. You heard that the tomb was empty. He had risen from the dead, and he was seen. And better than that, you got word he wants to meet with you. You've been told to go to the mountain of Galilee. Look at verse 16. The power text begins. Now, the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. See, these 11 remaining disciples, these apostles, they've been told by the women that Jesus, we've seen him. He lives, and he wants to meet with you. Go to the mountain. Where it all began is where Jesus wants to see you. See, back in the beginning of his ministry, Jesus left Galilee to head to the Jordan to be baptized. And now, where is he at after his resurrection? Back in Galilee at the mountain. And he wants to meet with his disciples. Imagine if that were you. What would you be expecting? Wouldn't you be filled with hope? Man, he's going to have some good news for me. Finally, my time has arrived. He's finally going to take control and make things right. But that's not quite how things turn out, is it? It's not quite what they find when they get to the mountain, is it? They see Jesus and they worship him. But yet, there's also this doubt. Look at verse 17. Look what it says. And when they saw him, they worshiped him. But some doubted. This can be a very difficult and troubling passage. It's unclear who was it that was sent to the mountain. Who was worshiping? Why were they doubting? What was going on here? These are issues that commentators are divided over, and they've got all kinds of myriad of solutions for them. But I think the best way to understand this text is by understanding what's going on here. You've got the 11 apostles being directed by Jesus to come to the mountain to meet with him. So they show up, and they see the risen Lord and Savior. They're excited, so they worship him. But this is all kind of brand new to them. They're still kind of puzzled. What does all this mean? We saw you die on the cross, but now you're alive. So what's going to go on? They're still not quite sure. They don't quite yet have the spirit. So things are kind of brand new, unclear, confusing. So what do they do? They worship and they doubt. Or better yet, they hesitate. See, the Greek word you see here translated as doubt is only used in two places in all of Scripture. Right here and in Matthew 14, 31. And what's the context of Matthew 14, 31? This is where Peter is told by Jesus, come to me. So he gets out of the boat and walks on the water. But then what happens? He sees his circumstances. And so he hesitates or doubts and starts to sink. Well, that's kind of the picture of what you got going on right here. These apostles are on the mountain. They see Jesus. They see their risen Lord and Savior. But yet, they're kind of unsure. So they doubt or they hesitate. See, this is kind of the picture of what it's like to live the Christian life. To be one with a divided mind. One who's filled with hope and expectation, and yet also having doubt. You ever have that in your life? You ever have that in your walk with Jesus times when you doubt? You're filled with hope, but yet you also have this doubt? See, that's the reality of living the Christian life, where you face struggles, moral concerns, financial woes, health concerns, all kinds of persecutions and hardships. And what can they do? They can cause even the best Christian to hesitate when Christ says, come follow me. This is why we all need to be honestly asking, during these times, are you waiting, waiting for God's promises, or are you doubting, doubting that it will ever happen? Being caught between waiting and doubting is a very common thing. And it's not something that just Christians experience, so do non-believers. Because unbelievers, they look at their life and they know things aren't so good. They know things could be better. And they've heard about Jesus, and they think maybe that's the answer, but yet they hesitate. They're not sure. So let me make things clear for you. If you're here this morning as one who's never publicly professed your faith in Jesus Christ, because you doubt what this means, well, remove all doubt. Because Jesus Christ really was born of a virgin. 
really walked in perfect obedience to the law, and really died on the cross for you and your sins. He really rose from the dead to gain victory over death and sin. And he ascended on high to grab hold of all the benefits of redemption that the Spirit applies to you if you just turn and trust in Jesus Christ. So don't hesitate anymore, but let today be the day that you say, yes, Jesus is my Lord and Savior. And if you've already done that, if you're here this morning as one who's already professed Jesus as your Lord and Savior, then I know you too still have doubts because you have times where you struggle, times where you struggle about faith and repentance, times when you sin and you say, can Christ forgive me yet again? How could I be a believer and keep sinning this way? Well, listen, put those doubts aside. Don't fall into a lack of faith, hopelessness, or despair. But see how you, like the disciples, can be prone to have a divided mind, one that both has hope and doubt in it. And what that means is, what you need to do is be refocused. Don't focus on what you don't have, what you didn't get, or what you're missing, but rather focus on what Christ promises, what he says awaits you. See, what that'll do for you is, that'll turn things around for you. It's easy to get blue, to get down, to be downcast when you're looking at what you don't have and what's missing. But doubt is undone when you turn and look at what yet's to come, what is yet to come. So while you wait, don't doubt, but get busy, which brings us to our second point. There's work to do. <laughs> you ever finish a task and sigh in relief because you think it's done? Only to discover it's not. Maybe you clean up all the dishes, you take them all off the table, wash them all up, dry them, put them all away, and you think, finally, I'm done. And then you discover there's plates in the living room. Isn't that so debilitating? I remember years ago when I was much younger and much stronger, I worked for Putin Paint. And I had to make this delivery. They wanted 20, 50 gallon drums of paint. And I had to deliver them to an apartment complex. I had to park the vehicle 60 to 70 yards from this apartment building, carrying them two at a time, 10 trips, 100 pounds at a shot, walking 60 to 70 yards. I finally put the last two down, dropped them down, and said, Yes, I'm done. Only to have the apartment manager come to me and say, you're not done. They need to go down in the basement. I was devastated. I was crushed. And that's kind of what you see going on in our text here this morning. Because the disciples have been told, Jesus wants to see you at the mountain. They're excited. They've got this anticipation. They're thinking, finally, my time has come. And what do they do? They get there. They worship Jesus. And he speaks to them. And things start out pretty good. Look at verse 18. Look what he says. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. This is pretty positive. Notice he doesn't talk about their abandonment at the cross. He's not mentioning to them how they all ran away, leaving him alone to face his trial, pretending they didn't even know him. Even as we read from Peter this morning, what did he say? I don't know the man. I don't know who he is. No talk of that. Just these words that Jesus is now in charge. This is kind of like your friend at work becoming the boss. But he's not in charge of the mail room. He's in charge of the whole company. You know things are good for you now, right? And that's what the disciples are thinking. Because notice what Jesus says. All authority. He says, I now have all authority. Now, this, don't misunderstand this. He's not saying he's become more authoritative. Jesus spoke with his heavenly Father's authority during his earthly ministry. What he's saying now is the scope of his authority has expanded. He's been raised up, as it were. He's now in charge of things on heaven and earth. And this is something the disciples were waiting for. This is what they were hoping for. Finally, the <coughs> Roman reign of terror is over. Jesus Christ reigns, and he's going to put these earthly rulers in their place. Or so they thought. But that's not what Jesus said, was it? No, the message then was, things aren't over. You're not done, but there's work to do. And the work is kingdom work. Jesus Christ is continuing his earthly ministry. His time on earth is almost done. He's about to ascend into heaven, but there's still work to do. And who does he call to the task? His apostles, his disciples, and all of you. You realize that? There's work to do, kingdom work yet to be done. This pronouncement of authority 
isn't saying things are now done for you, it's over, your time has come, but rather it's the impetus to give you confidence, the assurance that you've got the power to go and do what Christ commands you to do because he's in charge. You work for the boss. You realize that? You're his right-hand man, his right-hand woman. That's the idea. You need to be empowered because like the apostles are being told here, there's still work to be done. And that work that remains, the work to be completed, is none other than making disciples. Look at how verse 19 begins. Go, therefore, and make disciples. The making of disciples right here is the main verb, and I have to tell you something, it's imperative. You know what that means? That means Jesus isn't giving you a suggestion. He's not making a request. He doesn't desire this. He commands this. This is a command, something your Lord and Savior tells you you have to do. That means making disciples isn't something you put on your bucket list. You don't say, you know, I want to go skydiving. I'd like to visit the Grand Canyon. Maybe try that new restaurant. I would maybe make a disciple. No, you're commanded to go and make disciples. And you know you can do so because the one with all authority has commanded you to do so. And he tells you how to do so. He lays out the, the, basically the, the way it works. He gives you the tools. He tells you there's three aspects to disciple making. And here's what they are. It involves going, inviting, and teaching. Verses 19 to 20, look what they say here. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. This is making clear that making disciples begins with going. You know what that means? You can't sit at home in your lazy boy chair, catching up on your soaps, and make disciples. You gotta actually leave your house. You gotta go. You gotta go to where the lost are found. And you know what the good news is? The lost are found everywhere. They're all around you. They're in your household. They're in your neighborhoods. They're in your works, your schools, your banks, your grocery stores. See, that's the beauty of living in a non-Christian society. We often think things are so horrible because everybody doesn't follow Christ. But it's actually a wonderful thing. You know why? Because it means you've got just what Christ describes for you in John 14, 35. Fields that are white or ripe for the harvest. If you know anyone in your circle of friends, your relatives, your co-workers, your school, at the bank you go to, the grocery store you go to, the bakery you go to, Anybody there knows about Christ, gets what you've got. Fields that are white or ripe for the harvest. Christ has given you fields. He's given you a command to go, and he shows you where to go, to where the lost are found, to where people don't know Christ, don't profess Christ for Lord and Savior. So what you need to do is go. Go and tell them who Jesus Christ is and what he's done. Tell them how he was born on a virgin on the first Christmas morn. Tell them how he walked in perfect obedience, obeying the law perfectly, and how he died on the cross as that perfect atoning sacrifice. And he did it for you, and he did it for them. Show them what they can have, what the promises that Christ holds out before them. Let them know that Jesus Christ died so they might live. And don't leave anyone out, because as you see in the text, the command is for people of all nations. And as you go, make sure you invite them. Invite them to worship and invite them to become part of God's family. See, discipleship, it's not just about converting people or getting them saved, but rather it's about getting to be part of Christ's family, being drawn into his covenantal community. And you know how that happens? It starts with an invitation. Hey, we're having church on Sunday. You ought to come. Hey, you ought to come see what Christ's family is doing here at Grace Church. See, what you're seeing here is being baptized in the triune name of our God. And you know what that represents? It represents church membership. Because that's the showing the outsider, the one who's an unbeliever, one who's not part of the covenantal community, being baptized and brought in. You know what that says for you? It says you've got people all around you that you can invite. 
I guarantee you, you know at least two people that don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Am I right about that? I'm guessing I am. Have you invited them? Have you told them about Jesus? Have you told them how they need Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior? See, you need to do that. You've got fields around you that are right. And you know who this is talking about? Atheists and agnostics. Don't invite your Christian neighbor to church. They got a church. Invite your unsaved friend, your unbelieving co-worker. The one who says God doesn't exist. Say, come talk to my parents. Let him know that. If he hadn't talked to you about that, invite him. Because that's what you need to do. So the question is, you understand that people need to hear who Christ is and what he's done? So the question is, are you willing to go and tell them? And as you do so, are you willing to show them, to teach them what it looks like to obey Christ's commands? See, that's the third part of disciple-making, is teaching. Teaching people, new converts, what it means to truly follow Jesus Christ. You realize a lot of people don't go to church on Sunday because they don't know that Christ commands them to do so. Have you told them that? You need to do so. And understand that you do this not just with your words, but much more so with your actions. What you do often means so much more than what you say. That means your words have to match your life. If you tell people, Christians are those who love to worship and love to be around God's family, do you know what that means? You need to show them by actually loving to be in worship and loving to be around God's family. That means you might have to give up the time on the tennis courts, give up your time at the bakery to actually go to worship or actually go to some event that your church is holding. And telling people, I love being there. I love God's people. You show them and they get the message. <coughs> what that says to you is you need to be in worship each and every Lord's Day. You need to be an active member, not just a member, but an active member of Grace Church. Actively involved in the family. Otherwise, what you're doing is you're saying one thing and doing another. And you're living out that age-old adage, do as I say, not as I do. And as you know, that never flies. People see that coming a mile away. So make sure your words and actions match. If you're a disciple of Christ, then it's real easy. Here's what you do. Live like a disciple. You hear that? If you're a disciple of Christ, then live like a disciple. It's that simple. Do this, and you'll be teaching others what it means to observe all that Christ commands you. But there's another aspect to it. Because you've got to know what Christ commands. That's the beauty of being in church. You get to hear what God's word says. You get to understand. It's the beauty of reading his word. You get to see what he says. <coughs> see, contrary to that statement that ignorance is bliss, it's not. It's deadly dangerous. Because if you don't know what God commands, how are you going to show and teach others? You yourself need to know. Christ calls each and every one of you to himself because there's work to do. <coughs> there's a lot of people to save. No one person can do it all. That means you need to do your part. Are you willing to do so? Are you willing to go and obey Christ's command by going and making disciples? Are you going forward knowing that there's more work to do and saying Christ is calling for just this task? <coughs> and to help you to do justice, hear this. Get this down. There's more to come. See, your works have a purpose. That brings us to our third point. There's more to come. I know the thought of going out and intentionally sharing Christ is probably a scary <coughs> proposition. Not just with the world, but especially with sharing Christ with your relatives, your loved ones, your friends, your co-workers. But again, understand, it's not a choice. It's a command. Your Lord and Savior, who has all authority, has commanded you to do just that. The Great Commission is required. And you know why? Because the work you do is a work of life and death. Do you realize that? That's how important it is. It's a life and death matter. Ask yourself these questions. If you don't tell those in your circle about Christ, if you don't invite them to church, if you don't show them what it means to follow Jesus Christ, then who will? 
How will they hear? How will they know? How will they learn? <coughs> it might be scary, but it's nowhere near as scary as thinking about your loved one burning in hell. Because that's what happens if they don't hear, if they don't know, if they're not taught. And understand, you can go and do as God commands you, because all you have to do is go and share your story. And you can do this because you're not alone. You realize that? You're part of Christ's family, the covenantal community, and Christ is right there by your side. He's with you all the time. That's the promise he gives you. As a promise, it remains until Christ returns. Verse 20, look out what it says there. I'm with you always. This gives you the confidence that you can go forth obeying Christ's command to go and make disciples. Because you know he's right there by your side. And he indwells you through his spirit. Do you realize that? You realize God's spirit indwells you? The moment you profess Christ your Lord and Savior, it's that spirit brought unity that brings your saving faith about. So if you're a disciple of Christ, then you know where Christ is at? He's right with you. You don't have to go searching for him because he's where you're found. This means you're never on your own. At those times when the world seems like a dark and lonely place, those times when you're crying out, nobody understands me, nobody knows what I go through, oh, I suffer all alone, that's hogwash. Because Christ understands and he's there with you right by your side and dwelling you through his spirit. And what this means for you is you've got the power you need to come up against those who have the hardest head and the hardest hearts. Because you've got the power of God, the power of his word that breaks down and breaks through the difficult, most difficult barriers. You need to <coughs> obediently go and obey Christ's command. And you do so by sharing his word, living out his truths, praying that disciples might actually be made through you. Do you ever pray that? God, make disciples through me. Use me to make at least one disciple this year. See, you can do that knowing that Christ is with you, and you can do it when you're focused on the fact that he's coming back for you. You realize that? He's coming back. That's how our text ends. That's what's in view. That's why this is so crucial to the text here. Look how verse 20 ends. He says, I'm with you always. When? To the end of the age. The fact that Christ tells you he's with you to the end of the age means there's an end. That means this time on earth will come to a conclusion. This fact alone ought to give you an eternal perspective. Because you recognize here is not what it's about, but it's where you're going is what it's all about. Knowing there's an end puts things in a whole new light, a whole new perspective for you. Just think about running a marathon, and you're at mile 20. Are you thinking about the 20 miles you run and how tired you are? No, you think about how there are only six miles to go, that's it. That gives you the power to go on. Or think about when you've got that 24-hour virus. You know what you can look forward to? Hour 25. When you know you'll be on the day, things are going to get better. That's why we love it when a job is done. Because it tells us it is finished. Our toil, our turmoil, our pain, our hardship has all come to an end. And you know what? That's the thought you want to have as you walk through your days on this earth. Because this sin-cursed world is coming to an end. There's an end date in view. We don't know when it is because God hasn't told us. But we know it's coming. And it might happen at any moment. Which means there may not be a tomorrow to make a disciple. So if you're waiting for tomorrow to start, stop that thought. Because today may be your last day. You realize that? This could be your very last worship service. You ever think about that? When you're going to think about, I'm not going to go to church today, we realize that could be the last time you had to worship on earth. So don't stop now going, but go. Get in your car and go. See, the reality is, Christ may come back at any moment. Before this sermon ends, he may be coming on the clouds to draw his people home. And if that's the case, then will he find you? And will he say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Look at all the disciples I made through you, because you were obedient to my commands. And if today is not your last day, and you have it tomorrow, then make sure you use it wisely. Go forth and do what Christ commands you to do. Go forth and make disciples. 
Do this knowing there's more to come. Eternity awaits. That's your hope. If you know anything about football, then you know there's a difference in how they play in the last two minutes of the game. When there's two minutes left, suddenly there's an urgency to move the ball downfield and to get into the other team's end zone. Not quite the same at the beginning of the game, but at the end of the game, there's this urgency that comes into play. And this is because the reality is upon them that the game's almost done. And this is a picture of how you want to be living your life. Like the game's almost done. Like there's just two minutes to go. Because you don't know when you'll breathe your last. See, that means you don't want to live your life lackadaisical, saying tomorrow I'll get started. Tomorrow I'll get better at doing what God Christ commands. Today is the day. Now's the time. Because there's something to look forward to. There's a place that you're moving toward. It's Christ's return. It's Christ calling you to himself when he calls you to your heavenly homecoming where you get to eternally worship and serve your Lord and Savior. And you know what that means? That means you have the power. You hold the keys to life in your hand. You have the ability to put a smile, an eternal smile, on people's faces. And you can do this by simply talking to them about the joys of Christ. See, what you should be doing is showing people the joy you possess. And if you want to see a glimpse of this, then just come talk to Trinity after the service about her birthday, what she's hoping to get tomorrow, about the trip down to South Jersey to go to Penn Pizza. Look how look at she's smiling right now, you see? A big smile. That's what you want to look like because you've got the joy of Christ indwelling you. Brothers and sisters, there's no need to be down over what you didn't get for Christmas. There's no need to be sad about another year coming to an end. You've gotten another year older. But rather, there's a reason to smile. Because you know you're one step closer to your eternal homecoming. Heaven awaits all those who've been united to Jesus Christ. Because life is not here on this earth, but life is about your eternal dwelling. So no matter where you're at this morning, no matter what you're going through, no matter what you're thinking about you didn't get, your hardships, your suffering, your pain, change your perspective. Don't look at those things, but look heavenward. Look to Christ's promises. See what's to come. Because here's the reality. Your future's bright. The last chapter of your life is yet to be written, but I can tell you something. You know it's going to end good for you. So brothers and sisters, beat your post-Christmas blues by thinking eternally. Let's pray. Lord God, we do come before you this morning. We thank you and praise you, Lord, because you are so good to us, Lord. You show us, you promise us, you hold out before us, Lord, the truths of your word, the promises, Lord, of where we're headed. And Lord, you give us this clear command to go forth and make disciples. And Lord, you give us the power to do so. Because you give us your spirit, you give us your word. So Lord, help each and every one of us to start 2019 with an eternal perspective. Looking heavenward, looking to what's to come. And Lord, as we do so, help us to go forth seeking to make disciples. For we ask these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.